Kia ora. It's customary in my culture, the Māori culture, to offer a blessing or a karakia to a room before you begin any dialogue. And that's really just to set the tone and commit to the shared experience we're about to engage in. So I offer this to you. Whakatakate hau ke te uru, whakatakate hau ke te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ke uta, kia mā taratara ke tai. E he akiana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihe mauri ora. What that means is the west wind has changed. The south wind has fallen silent. The land bristles and the sea has goosebumps. The first rays of a red dawn pierce the night, revealing snow, ice and frost from the mountains to the seas. Up until the early 1900s, the majority of my Māori ancestors were, for the most part, illiterate. The way we shared our legends, our lessons, our learnings and our genealogy was predominantly through symbolism and performance, but also through the spoken word. That karakia that you just heard is somewhere between 800 and 1,000 years old. And what I love about it is that there's no ask in it. There's no, please give me health, please give me wealth, please give me this. All that it speaks to is exactly what this person is seeing. To me, it represents an observation of the present moment that has been preserved for over 800 years, a historical account of pure gratitude. And as we navigate this experience here today, I want you to hold that feeling of presence and gratitude with you because it's in that same truth that I found my freedom from chronic illness. So it's funny, up until recently, endometriosis was, and maybe still is, the most common disease you've never heard of. Its prevalence is on par with asthma and diabetes. It affects one in 10 Australian and New Zealand females. And I'm gonna say that again because I don't think as a society we're truly grasping the gravity of that. That's one in 10 Australian and New Zealand females. More broadly, that statistic expands to 176 million females worldwide. As I was standing over here in the wings, I was looking out and I was counting how many female bodies I could see. I lost count at 50. That means there's at least five of you in this audience who have endometriosis, don't know you have endometriosis, are possibly on the diagnosis pathway of which is on average seven to 10 years. And there may be some of you who suspect you have endometriosis after this talk. Please know that I stand with you as one in 10. Now I must preface this talk with this. I am not a medical professional. Everything you're gonna hear today is my own lived experience with endometriosis. Please, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna make any changes to your healthcare management, do it under the guise of a professional, but more importantly, someone who's appropriate for your healthcare needs. You wouldn't ask a plumber to fix your electric, so don't ask an orthopedic surgeon for advice about your uterus. Likewise, I'm gonna say the word uterus a lot. There may also be a casual vagina dropped in there. I, I urge you to think about this. If those words make you uncomfortable, how you might be part of the problem. One of the reasons we are in the midst of a female healthcare crisis is because we don't talk about our anatomy. That needs to change. So what is endometriosis? Well, endometriosis is clinically defined as tissue similar to tissue that lines the uterus, growing in places outside of the uterus. You can imagine that similar tissue is quite rich, quite dense, quite thick. If it's similarly composed to the tissue that lines the uterus, it's built for cultivating environments to grow tiny humans. It's built for growth. But what happens when that similar tissue starts growing in your abdominal cavity, when it starts latching onto your organs? Well, I can tell you the reality of living with this disease is so much more than that simplified clinical definition. Endometriosis is a highly individualized disease. The way symptoms manifest for each person can be entirely different, irrespective of the severity of diagnosis. You could have stage one, mild endometriosis, and have severe pain. You could have stage four, severe endometriosis, and have mild pain. The reverse is also true. I myself live with stage four endometriosis, severe endometriosis, and I had severe pain. It really depends where it's growing, how it's growing, and how it's being managed. Contrary to popular belief, no, a hysterectomy is not a cure, nor is getting pregnant and having children. There is currently no known cure and no known cause for endometriosis. Now, I liken, I liken the, the symptom index of endometriosis much to that of a physical copy of the Yellow Pages. It's long, it's overwhelming, it's complex, and you're not really fucking sure why it still exists in a world where we can land robots on Mars. 
You know, these symptoms include, and are certainly not limited to, painful periods. If you or someone you know is dealing with painful periods, this is not normal. I repeat, painful periods are not normal. Other symptoms include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, prolonged bowel and bladder problems, infertility, chronic fatigue, miscarriage, depression, anxiety. And many with endometriosis often have to undergo multiple surgeries. One, to diagnose it, because the only way to clinically diagnose it at present is via laparoscopy. And the second reason is to cut away some of that troublesome tissue. And that's really where my journey with endometriosis begins. Truth be told, I thought diagnosis was the hurdle I'd have to jump over in order to have this disease managed. Little did I know I'd only just reached the start line. It took me 16 years to get a diagnosis for endometriosis from first presentation of endometriosis-like symptoms. Now, as cringeworthy as this photo is, this is how I spent the majority of my teenage and my early 20s. My teenage years and my early 20s was like this. In and out of hospital, in and out of different doctor's clinics, on and off various different drugs, poked and prodded in, any, in every way possible. I was, I was deemed that girl at high school who was always in the nurse's sick bay with chronic period pain. I was diagnosed with everything from the flu to a urinary tract infection to just that time of the month. I started to normalize this experience and think, well, maybe I am being dramatic. Maybe everybody else has this pain. I'm just not strong enough to deal with it. That's a dangerous mindset for a teenager to start developing, to think they're broken, to feel like a burden, to be made out to be a liar. Now, there are a multitude of factors that contributed to my continual misdiagnosis. There is no one person to blame, but there is a continued and well-documented systematic failure on behalf of female health. The story isn't something new. For thousands of years, the female body has been misdiagnosed, misunderstood, and demonized. In 5th century BC, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, coined the term hysteria. Now, hysteria was a diagnosis to explain some of the symptoms and behavior of some females. The cause was deemed a wandering womb, this idea that the uterus would just walk around the body wreaking havoc. Now, I don't know what's scarier, thinking my uterus is some kind of wild animal <laughs> or assuming we know so much about the female body without any female input. Now, the female body continued to be de demonized for thousands of years. It wasn't until the 1950s that hysteria in its many medical iterations was finally dropped as a diagnosis, the 1950s. In the 1970s, females were excluded from some clinical drug trials. That meant that some of the medications we were taking weren't tested for safety and effectiveness on our bodies. Only after a long list of side effects where some, some great female health lobbyists lobbied for us to be re-included in those conversations in the 1990s. The 1990s. That meant that the drugs we were taking weren't tested for the safety and effectiveness on our bodies. Now, I must admit there are some incredible people working in the healthcare space who are working on incredible out health outcomes for us all. But unfortunately, the institutionalized sexism in healthcare diagnosis and management still persists. It exists in my story and the story of countless others. It inhibits our ability to see female pain as real. It restricts our ability to diagnose conditions like endometriosis, which when caught early, are a lot more manageable. Now, after I was diagnosed with endometriosis, the treatment plan I was given was morphine, tramadol, anti-inflammatories, hospital-grade anti-nausea, and a good luck, come back in three months for your scripts, and if symptoms persist, please, please visit your GP. I did this for about a year, and I, I only found myself more incapacitated in an entirely different way. I was like, fuck this. This is not going to be my life. So I started studying myself relative to current medical research and under the guise of a professional. I started looking at how my endometriosis symptoms were relating to my various different lifestyle inputs. I built out statistical models around diet, lifestyle and exercise relative to my pain. What transpired was something incredible. I started to see how my body worked. I started to notice that the more plants I incorporated into my diet, the better my symptoms became. I naturally transitioned to an anti-inflammatory plant-based diet because that's what the data was telling me to do. 
I also started doing more pelvic friendly exercise and moved away from some heavy impact stuff. My symptoms had never been better in my entire life and I no longer needed prescription pain medication. I even went on to build an app to help the other 176 million females with this disease because I thought, if this, if this approach could work for me, maybe it could work for them too. All of a sudden, I found myself a startup founder. How hysterical is that? But something still wasn't right. Something wasn't connecting in my mind, and I knew it. I'd failed to take into account the many years of emotional trauma that had weighed on my mental health. Elizabeth Gilbert says it perfectly when she says something to the effect of, ignored or unused emotion is not benign. And that's where Vipassana meditation comes in. I'd heard my friend who likes to indulge in alternative practices tell me about this meditation technique that had done wonders for their personal development and mental health. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna give it a go. What if a Vipassana meditation retreat is 10 days of absolute silence and meditation, no talking, no reading, no writing, no communication, no eye contact, just meditation from 4 a.m. to 9 p.m. for 10 days. Now, most people who do a Vipassana retreat have this one day or this one moment where your body arches up strong and tall and you feel, you feel something move through you. You feel like you know you are just living. You are not nature, but you are part of nature. The world pulses with life and so do you. And there's this inherent understanding that your human experience is beautiful and unique. It's a pure rush of gratitude much like my ancestors some 800 years ago. And that's what I want to leave you with today, gratitude. You know, physical healing is important, it's warranted, but mental healing is where you find your truth. Now, I want to illustrate this point through the lens of one of my favorite, my favorite movie scenes, and you'll have to bear with me on this. This is a scene from Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Now, if you haven't seen Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, one, I feel very sad for you, but two, I will try and set the scene as best I possibly can. So, Harry's a wizard, and in this scene, <laughs> yes, contrary to popular belief, in this scene, he's knelt by a lake clutching the body of his godfather, Sirius Black, who's been wounded. They've both been in an altercation with their friend who turns into a werewolf, it's a long story. But as he's knelt there by the lake, clutching the body of his godfather, Sirius Black. To make matters worse, these big black ghost things called Dementors descend and start sucking the soul out of them both. And just as they're both within an inch of their life, Harry looks across the lake and there's a shooting beam of light coming towards them. It dispels the Dementors and saves their life. And just before Harry collapses out of exhaustion, he, he looks across the lake and he sees who he thinks is his father at the source of that beam of light. And well, long story, but Harry's parents were killed by this evil dictator wizard. I digress. Um, but what transpires later in the movie is that Harry goes back in time to change some events of that day. And he finds himself standing in that very place where he saw his father shoot that beam of light across the lake. As he's standing there waiting for his father to arrive and he's watching the life being drained out of his body, he realizes something. No one is coming to save him. It, was, it wasn't his father he saw, but it was Harry himself who shot that beam of, beam of light across the lake. And that's, and that's a realization I had with my endometriosis. No one is coming to save me. I am in control of my own health. No doctor, no person, but me. And that beam of light that shoots across the lake to save me, that's gratitude. And the more I have developed in my presence, my gratitude, the infinitely better my life has become. And it has become about all of the things that I have to live for. Thank you.